nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. That's the latest commitment announced by the world's five nuclear weapon states. In a joint statement released on January the 3rd, leaders of China, France, Russia, the UK and the United States reiterate that the avoidance of war between nuclear weapon states and the reduction of strategic risks are their foremost responsibilities. What's the significance of this statement? How does it align with the ultimate goal of a world free of nuclear weapons? And what's China been doing? in promoting nuclear disarmament. Welcome to this special edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Fu Tsung, Director General of the Department of Arms Control of the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Fu, welcome to The Point. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, in the joint statement, as I said, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, who are also five uh, nuclear weapons state, known as the P5, reiterated their commitment uh, to the principle of non-proliferation, disarmament, and peaceful use of nuclear energy. The statement says the five countries reaffirm that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, and that nuclear weapons, for as long as they continue to exist, should serve defensive purposes, deter aggression and prevent war. How significant is this joint statement? Uh, first, let me say that uh, this is indeed a very important document. I will say it is a document of historic importance um, because uh, this is the first joint statement ever by the five nuclear weapons, by the leaders of the five nuclear weapon states uh, on issues related to nuclear weapons. And you know that uh, the leaders of the five nuclear of the P5, uh, which happen to be the uh, the, the uh, five nuclear weapon states as well, and the leaders of these countries do not issue joint statement very often. No. So last time they, they issued a joint statement was more than 20 years ago. Mm. That was in the year 2000 after the uh, the Millennium Summit. So uh, this by itself shows the significance of this document. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of the content, just now you mentioned that uh, this is one of the, the most important principles that has been reaffirmed in this document. That is, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And uh, this is actually gives us the understanding of the, uh, of the true nature of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are the ultimate deterrence. It's not for war fighting. And uh, the recognition by the five nuclear weapon states of this basic fact will go a long way towards maintaining global strategic stability and uh, reducing the danger of a nuclear war. And, and I think this is a quite pertinent, and I would say it is uh, very, even very timely, given the, the high tension that is building both in Europe and uh, to a lesser extent in Asia Pacific. So uh, this commitment is uh, very important indeed. And actually, in addition to this important principle, there are other elements or points right. that need to be uh, highlighted in this document. For instance, uh, the, uh, the leaders emphasized <coughs> that uh, none of the nuclear weapons will be targeting against each other or indeed against anybody else. So this is also important. This will help reduce the danger of unauthorized or unintentional uh, launch of nuclear weapons. This is by itself a confidence building measure and right. it's very important. Right, we'll talk about that in just a moment, mm -hmm. but I want to highlight this part which uh, caught my attention because mm. the statement also says the five countries each intend to maintain and further strengthen our national measures to prevent unauthorized or unintended use of nuclear weapons. We reiterate the validity of our previous statements on detargeting, which is what you were talking yes. about, reaffirming that none of our nuclear weapons are targeted at each other mm. or at any other state. How do you assess, however, the level of mutual trust at this moment between major countries, especially between China and the, the United States, for obvious reasons? And does the statement alleviate the concern that there could be a potential nuclear conflict between the two sides? 
yes, we have to recognize the fact that, uh, as I said, there are tensions mounting uh, both in Europe and in this part of the world between the major powers. Uh, but this is a fact we need to recognize. And at the same time, we, we need to realize that uh, the, uh, the leaders of all these countries have realized the danger uh, that is inherent uh, in, in the basic fact that all these countries possess nuclear weapons. And, uh, and that is the reason why the leaders have committed themselves uh, to this basic principle that uh, nuclear war cannot be fought. And also in terms of the, of the detargeting, this is actually a concrete measure of uh, not allowing unauthorized or unintentional launch of nuclear weapons because uh, in the, during the peak of the Cold War era, uh, the, uh, the nuclear weapons of the Soviet Union and the United States were maintained at an extremely high level of alert. So there was a high and a genuine danger of unintentional or accidental launch. And so uh, in order to, to prevent that, the leaders actually uh, in the past, uh, since the late 1990s, uh, China and uh, the Russian Federation, China and the US, we have uh, issued joint declarations on detargeting. And I think that is by itself, as I said, a confidence building measure and uh, it will actually be, con be conducive to reduce tension and also uh, to drastically reduce the danger of an accidental war, nuclear mm. war. Um, as you mentioned, there have been mountain tensions between mm. major countries, but on the other hand, uh, this is an unprecedented, extremely rare statement, mm -hmm. extremely rare consensus among the P5 countries at this critical time. So it, I can imagine there must have been a lot of work, mm -hmm. right, between, behind the scene exactly. by people, by leaders <coughs> and uh, senior administration officials mm. among the P5. So what kind of work has been put in by P5, especially uh, in, in your case by China, in in, yes. you know, drafting, reaching the consensus, and releasing such a joint statement? Uh, that is a very good question. <laughs> Actually, uh, yes, this document uh, was the result of uh, hard work uh, for the uh, last uh, two years, at least. And, um, well, as far as China, China actually, I would say, that played uh, a very positive, and I would say, a leading role in this effort, uh, because uh, uh, this basic, uh, reiteration of the principle that the nuclear war cannot be won and thus not be fought was first pronounced uh, by in the 1985 uh, by Reagan and Gorbachev uh, between the Soviet Union and uh, the uh, the United States and that was at the height of the uh, of the Cold War and uh, the two leaders announcement of this basic principle actually uh, did a lot in reducing tension between the two su nuclear superpowers. And now that um, more than uh, 30 years or f 40 years later, and uh, we are now faced uh, with a situation whereby the tension between countries or among the big powers, regrettably, is, uh, is quite high. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the non-nuclear weapon states um, quite uh, reasonably expected the, uh, the P5 or the, the, the nuclear weapon states to reiterate uh, this basic principle. And China was the first to respond to this appeal from the non-nuclear weapon states. And in our national uh, report to the NPT review conference, we have put that into our, our report. And now in our bilateral uh, declaration with, the, with Russia, we have put that into our bilateral declaration. And within the P5, uh, China has been the one that advocated that uh, we, the P5, should collectively reaffirm this basic principle. And uh, originally, uh, it was uh, not responded uh, very positively. Uh, we know that during the, uh, the Trump administration, the US was not interested in anything that is remotely related to arms control mm -hmm. issues and it was not responded uh, very positively. And China was the only country among the P5 that reiterated publicly, and it was widely uh, welcomed by the non-nuclear weapon states. And China has continued to push this, 
and then uh, Russia was uh, was very positive, and then the uh, the, the U.S. Uh, with the change of government there, um, President Biden's administration agreed to this, and then and and later on, U.K. and the France came on board. Mm. So uh, this whole document, even though if you look at it, it is not long, but um, it less has than two pages. Exactly. But uh, it was the result of two years' hard mm. work. I want to I ask a little bit more details between mm. the interaction you had with the U.S. administration, mm -hmm. right? The relationship has mm -hmm. been fraught with uh, trouble, let's mm. say. Um, how have you been able to work towards the same, same goal, and what does that signify? Within the P5, first let me say that within the P5, that there is a P5 process whereby the, uh, the nuclear issues were discussed very thoroughly. And within the P5 consultation process, China and the, and the U.S. reacted, interacted uh, quite um, professionally, mm -hmm. I would say. And a lot of uh, discussions uh, have been had. And uh, on a bilateral basis, uh, we know that the saga of the, uh, the Trump administration when they talked about this trilateral uh, negotiation and so on and so forth. And uh, let me say that uh, we have been saying all this, uh, this for a long time, that that was only a ruse or, 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 or a hoax <clears throat> that uh, the, the U.S. side put out to, to, to provide cover for their own inaction in terms of the uh, nuclear arms control and uh, efforts. So uh, we resisted that. Basically, you were talking about the U.S. was seeking a trilateral nuclear arms reduction <coughs> negotiation exactly. involving China, where, mm. whereas it was originally between Russia and the United States. That's true, yeah. yes. And then uh, our basic uh, point is that uh, in the past few decades, China has been uh, exercising a great restraint in our development of nuclear forces. And China has adopted the, the, the no-first-use uh, policy. And... Uh, it is not, the China's nuclear arsenal is not at the same level as the U.S. or the Russian Federation. So it is unreasonable to expect China to join in a nuclear arms reduction negotiation because at first China is not at the same level. And actually we ask the same one simple question. By inviting China into this trilateral negotiation, do you want China to raise our level of nuclear armaments to the U.S. level, or do you plan to reduce your nuclear armaments to our level? And then, then the U.S. was unable to answer that basic question. So well, there was no point in China participating in this trilateral mm -hmm. negotiation. But on a bilateral basis, there has been uh, actually uh, existing channels of uh, consultation between the two countries. Actually, before Trump came to power, China and the U.S. had maintained regular uh, arms control uh, dialogues. And, uh, and then uh, Trump uh, suspended that. And now the, uh, the, uh, with the Biden administration uh, coming to power, and our view has always been that we are open to arms control dialogue with all countries, including the U.S. Mm. And so uh, we hope that the U.S. can create uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, favorable conditions uh, that can materialize uh, this uh, dialogue. So basically, the, the reaching, the, the release of this joint statement also uh, gave a positive signal that China and the United States can work on such important strategic matters professionally. Can we say that? Yes, of course. Actually, uh, as, as we, our understanding is that uh, now we have this uh, P5 uh, uh, declaration at the highest level, so this document should provide the guiding principles for any bilateral efforts that the, uh, that the two sides may have in terms of the uh, uh, arms control dialogue and the strategic uh, security dialogue. And in our view, China and the U.S. being the, uh, the nuclear weapons uh, countries, and uh, we are the two largest economies in the world, so there is a lot of things that we can cooperate on. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we, we have the shared responsibility towards the world, not only to our two countries. We have always believed that the, the 
the bilateral relationship between China and the U.S. goes beyond the scope of the, uh, our two countries. Right. It affects the entire world. So uh, we share the, the responsibility towards the world, and uh, there are so many things that we can uh, cooperate. Mm -hmm. For instance, on the issue of non-proliferation, that is in my area, so on the issues of non-proliferation, and on issues of biosecurity, and then there are many other issues that we can cooperate on. So uh, the thing is we need to have the right environment bilaterally, in our bilateral relationship, yeah. in order to uh, jumpstart all these dialogues. Some U.S. officials, however, allege that China is engaged in a remarkable expansion <coughs> of nuclear capabilities, hyping up a so-called China nuclear threat theory. Could you help us understand exactly uh, on what level is China developing its nuclear capability? Uh, why should the world not be concerned? Uh, first, let me say that uh, the assertion that China is expanding remarkably uh, our nuclear capabilities is not true. And uh, as I said, uh, China adopts this uh, no first use uh, policy and uh, we have always maintained our nuclear forces at the minimum level that is required for our national defense. That is interpreted by the West as a minimum deterrence policy. And uh, I will say that these things have not changed and will not change. And uh, this is point number one. And secondly, uh, but that does not mean that China should not modernize our nuclear capabilities. If for nothing else, uh, for the safety and reliability uh, issues. Uh, because uh, nuclear weapons also get aged. So uh, we, we sometimes we need to modernize and so that they remain reliable and, re and they remain safe by themselves. Mm. So these things oh, we also need to uh, 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 develop. And, and the third point I want to emphasize, that uh, no first use and the minimum, minimum deterrence doesn't mean that uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese nuclear forces will remain static um, because our security environment changed. And we have seen that uh, in the past few years, and even today, the U.S. regards China as the biggest competitor. And, uh, you know, the U.S. is putting trillions of dollars upgrading their nuclear arsenals, which is already the most sophisticated and the largest mm -hmm. nuclear arsenal. And also, they have taken these step, such steps as uh, withdrawing from the uh, INF, which is the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and, and they have also publicly announced that they are going to, uh, to station in this part of the world Intermediate Range ground-based missiles, which actually may affect China's uh, strategic capability, the su survivability of China's nuclear capabilities. And also they are actually developing the missile defense capabilities, and that they are actually uh, deploying all these capabilities around China, and the, on the, what we call on the doorstep of China. So all these have gravely aggravated China's security environment. So that necessitates China developing its nuclear deterrence capability. This is very important, but it doesn't mean that China by expanding a little bit its nuclear capabilities, will change its no first use policy, will change its uh, no, uh, minimum deterrence uh, policy. China has no intention to compete with any country in terms of the number and in terms of the size of its nuclear capabilities. China is the only P5 country to uh, remain committed to the principle of non-first use of nuclear weapons yes. at any time and under any circumstances. China mm. is the only country to That's declare that among the P5. What's the significance of that? Can other countries follow suit? Well, actually, as, as, as we always say, that China is the only con nuclear weapon state that declares no first use, unconditional no first use. And that, was, that has been Chinese policy since day one of China's entering into its possession of nuclear weapons since 1964. Mm. And that is very important. The no first use 
uh, policy is not only a declaratory uh, policy, it has practical implications, both in terms of the, uh, the size of the arsenal and also in terms of the, uh, the, the mode of deployment. Uh, for instance, the, the level of alert. Uh, all these will flow from this no first use policy. Because China takes this no first use policy, China's uh, nuclear forces has, been, has remained at a very low level. Because we, for us, uh, nuclear weapons are not for war fighting purposes. Mm. And yeah. uh, they will, we will only retaliate after we are attacked by nuclear weapons. So we hope that other countries can follow suit. Right. Well, time is very limited. I still have three questions I want to get your answers. So, yeah, um, first, about AUKUS, right? China yeah. has, it's a very important <clears throat> matter. China says it poses serious nuclear non-proliferation risks and violates the spirit of the non-proliferation treaty. But some people say by acquiring nuclear powered submarine does not mean acquiring nuclear weapons. What exactly is China's stance? Yeah, the crux of the matter is that uh, the, uh, because of the AUKUS, UK and the US, mainly the US, most probably will transfer weapon-grade high-enriched uranium to a non-nuclear weapon state, which is Australia. Mm. And uh, the existing IEA safeguards cannot provide sufficient guarantee that Australia will not divert these materials to develop nuclear weapons. So that is the crux of the matter. And, and uh, there are also very bad implications. For instance, this creates a bad precedent that other countries may follow. We know that uh, there are countries, even in our neighborhood, in the Northeast Asia uh, part, there are countries that are contemplating this, to follow the example of Australia. And we are following the situation very closely. And also, it also exposed the double standard of these countries, because when we talk about the, the Iranian nuclear issue, the right. JCPOA says that Iran cannot possess uh, uh, nuclear materials that is enriched to a level higher than 3.67. Mm. You know what the, uh, the, uh, the purity of the nuclear material that the U.S. may transfer to, to, to Australia? It is 97%. Yeah. So these materials can be very easily yeah. turned into nuclear weapons. Um, China has not, like the other P5 country, has not signed up to the Treaty on the Prohibi Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons, which came in effect uh, a year ago. Mm -hmm. What is China's stance towards a nuclear-free world? Yes, actually, our, we have always said that uh, we, we stand for a, a nuclear-free world. We have always stood for the complete prohibition and thorough destruction of nuclear weapons. And that is a long-term goal that we will not abandon. Uh, at the same time, we, we believe that such a goal can only be achieved in a step-by-step -step manner. And uh, when it comes to nuclear disarmament, we should take into consideration the security considerations. So uh, that is the reason why, on the one hand, we share uh, the goal of those, the, the member states of this uh, treaty. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we do not believe that uh, this goal can be achieved with one goal. But at the same time, we are actually engaged in a, a frequent dialogue with non-nuclear weapon states. We share their goal, and at the same time, we say that uh, we can uh, help promote the process. And uh, but at this moment, we are not in a position to join hmm. because of the security environment we are faced with. Hmm. Finally, uh, the only time <coughs> that a nuclear bomb has ever been used is, was over Japan, of course, yeah. in 1945 by the United States. What lessons must mankind remember, keep in mind, so that the mushroom cloud never happens again over cities? In the yes. The, uh, the nuclear bombings of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki are tragedies. Uh, in the human history. There is no doubt about that. <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, uh, these events need to be put into a proper historical context. And uh, lessons need to be drawn from both sides, both from the countries that use the nuclear weapons and uh, 
and from the sign that nuclear weapons was used upon them. At least one big lesson is that uh, uh, aggression will not pay, and um, ag aggression would beget annihilation. So uh, at the same time, standing here uh, 70 years later, we need, to we need to try our utmost to prevent the nuclear weapons from being used again. And that, again, coming back to the joint statement, that is the importance of this joint statement. So nuclear weapons need to realize that we should not use nuclear weapons. And in our view, one way to do that, given the current international uh, security environment, given the policies of the, uh, the nuclear weapon states, one concrete step would be the no first use. So we, that's why we have been advocating this. And the one thing we would like to call upon Japan to rethink is that the, the, the funny thing is, what is perplexing about the Japanese position mm -hmm. is that on the one hand, it is the only victim of a nuclear use. And also, it advocates nuclear disarmament. But on the other hand, it is the most vocal opponent of no first use policy. They are actually working very hard, vigorously, against the possible adoption by the U.S. Uh, in term, uh, uh, adoption of the no first use policy. That is, I don't think, a logical position for the Japanese to take. A lot of uh, answers yes. are still in the air. That's but, true. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> let's take this step uh, one at a time, and this joint statement hopefully will um, bring us will keep us a little bit further away from a possible nuclear war. That's our hope, yes. Let's uh, work together for that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Fu Song, Director General of the Department of Arms Control of the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.